Welcome to section 4.16, and we're going to discuss non-Mendelian genetics now. We've discussed Mendelian. Now that was where there was, you know, one trait, two possibilities. If the dominant allele was present, you were dominant, you know, as 100% dominant or recessive. That's called complete dominance. That's what Mendel found. But there are some situations we've found since Mendel's work that are a bit more complex, and so we oftentimes refer to those as non-Mendelian genetics, which is probably most of genetics. I mean, he studied the simplest possible situations. Uh, but some of these specifics will be codominance and incomplete dominance. So right here, we have incomplete dominance represented. So how this works is we don't really have a true dominant and a true recessive. So what we have instead is there's three possibilities. So looking at this, there's a red flower, and that red flower will have two red alleles. You have a white flower, which has two white alleles. So homozygous dominant will be red phenotypically. Homozygous recessive will be white phenotypically. Everything's kind of normal thus far. But the trick is when you get to these heterozygotes, what happens with the heterozygotes is we get this blending, this mixture. So it's kind of like what the blending theory proposed. It's just very seldom actually happens. But in these incomplete dominant situations, it does happen where you get a mix. So if you have red and white, you get pink. If you had black and white, you'd get gray. If you had tall and short, you'd get medium. And so these heterozygotes in this scenario will be pink. Now, this is interesting because our phenotypic ratio now matches our genotypic ratio. If you remember before, with complete dominance, we had where the homozygous dominance and the heterozygotes all look dominant. So we had a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio because there were only two phenotypes, red and white. But now, because we've got this incomplete dominance, we no longer have this gap between phenotype and genotype. Instead, I can look at the organism and say, oh, it's pink. It's a heterozygote. There's no more guessing like there was before, where if you were red, if you were dominant, I didn't know if you were a heterozygote or homozygous dominant. The only way I could figure that out is to actually do a test cross where I bred you with someone recessive and saw if any recessive kids popped out. You know, that was the only way that we could sort this out. But now we can see it because it visually will be represented if you're a heterozygote. It will be distinct. So that's going to be this idea of incomplete dominance. It's like mixing paints. It's a blend. And we can always write that here just to make sure I drive it home because a lot of people confuse these two. That's why I'm trying to be strict here. Now, codominance is similar, but this won't be a blend. This is going to be where both of them are present. So instead of pink, you get red and white. So codominance, you're going to see both traits. Do not say this is a blend. They're both there together. Uh, so one of the common examples of this, aside from just you know organisms that are both red and white, or there are certain horses that have hair that's red and white, they're called roan. You know, there's lots of different organisms that have these traits where both things are present at the same time. One common example, though, will be sickle cell. The way sickle cell works, if you're homozygous for normal blood cells, all your blood cells will look like these guys here that look vaguely donut-shaped, not a hole in the center, but a depression. That's a normal blood cell, a normal red blood cell. That's what happens if you are homozygous normal. If you're a heterozygote, if you've got essentially one sickle cell allele, one healthy, one sickle cell allele, what you're going to have is a mix. You'll have some sickle cell cells, red blood cells, that are sickle-shaped, and you'll have some that are normal. If you're homozygous for sickle cells, so essentially little s, little s, what you'll see is you will have all sickle cells. And this is a problem because these sickle cells tend to clump. They don't live as long, so you get anemia, which is a low uh, red blood cell count. You get where they clump so they can cause organ failure, pain. It's not a great thing long term, especially if untreated. But if you're a heterozygote, it's actually awesome because by having this mix, you don't really get the negative symptoms because you still have enough good healthy cells doing fine. Uh, but these other funky cells tend to make it where you don't get malaria. And so you get this malaria resistance that makes this very advantageous in a lot of like tropical areas, uh, South America, uh, when you look at parts of Africa, you see this is actually really common to have this sickle cell trait kicking around, even though it's negative if you end up being homozygous recessive. And the reason is the heterozygotes are the best things to be because you still are healthy, but you also don't get malaria. And seeing as malaria kills a lot of people down there, that's a huge plus. Not so much if you're living in America where we don't really have malaria. 
At that point, it just becomes a bit more dangerous because being homozygous recessive is a big deal. But if you look under a microscope, you can tell phenotypically, is this person homozygous dominant, all healthy? Are they a heterozygote, a mix, or are they homozygous for sickle cell, all sickle cell? So you can choose for yourself what you're going to see over here. Uh, you'll also notice sometimes with codominance and incomplete dominance, you might see people stop using the uppercase, lowercase situation. So they might decide to do red. This would be essentially pink or red and white, and then they can do white. So don't be freaked out if you sometimes see them using things that are different and not just using the uppercase, lowercase, because that doesn't perfectly apply. You know, that really works out well if it's complete dominant not so much here. Occasionally they'll also do something where it's color, so they might just decide C is for color, and they'll do a, a superscript, so they'll say this is color red and this is color white. And that way you can still tell it's the same trait because it's still the big C, but you can see there's different versions. This is probably the most common thing that you'll see with codominance, uh, incomplete dominance, things like that, is this kind of superscript mentality. But you might see any of these, just don't freak out. Now, switching gears, we've also got situations where we can have multiple alleles, where there's not just two options. It's not just, you know, tall and short. It's not just purple and white. We've got a variety of options. One example that's commonly used is blood type. When you look at humans, we can have A blood type, B blood type, AB blood type, or O. There's actually more, but with this group of genes, with this specific uh, gene that we're looking at, there's ultimately going to be four possible phenotypes that you can get. People that have A, what that really means is they're producing a specific molecule on the red blood cells. People that have type B are producing a different molecule called the B antigen. Uh, people that are AB produce both of them, and people that are O produce none of them. And this is significant because if you have one of these antigens, so if you have this A antigen, and I give you to somebody that doesn't have it, like a person that's O, they attack it. So that's why you reject the blood, you'd go after it. If I give someone who's type B A blood, they'd also go after it because they don't recognize it. If I give someone who's AB blood, they could kind of care less because they've got all the antigens, so they're the universal acceptor. They're just like, hook me up, give me some blood. Whereas O is the pickiest. O can only get stuff from other O's. However, it's really good at giving because it can give it to pretty much anybody because there's no of the, none of these antigens, these molecules on the edge, to throw any flags, to say like, hey, I don't belong. And so type O is the best one if you're a giver, whereas type AB is the best if you're a taker. All right? Now how this works is there are ultimately three different alleles. There's an O allele, which is completely recessive. So it's oftentimes done as a, a lowercase i. The reason for this is the antigens are called immunoglobulins. And so they're just choosing I to be this unifying character. So lowercase i shows it's recessive. If it's I and then B is a superscript, that's type B. And if it's type A, the A allele, it's going to be I sub superscript A. And the reason for this is A and B are both codominant with each other. And so by doing them both as this kind of superscript, it lets people realize it's not like one of them wins. If they both show up, they both show up. It's not like they're going to actually fight and one comes out on top. So if your phenotype is AB, your genotype is going to be that you have an A allele, which provides you with the A part of this, and you have a B allele, which provides you with the B part. So you're codominant. You express both. If you're blood type A, there's two ways you could get it. You could be AA. That would certainly be type A. I mean, nothing else is there. But you could also be AO. Because remember, A is dominant to O, so you'd still be type A. A wins. Type B is very similar. You can be BB allele, or you can be BO. And you can go ahead and laugh for a second. And then for type O, there's only one way. You just got to have two O's. It's the only possible way you can get it because it's completely recessive. If any of the other ones show up, you're some other blood type. Uh, this one will do some practicing within class because this is fun when you start to cross parents to try to figure out what their offspring could be. And you can also use this, or they did use this, uh, in forensics for like crimes so they could try to figure out, all right, it's not perfect, but at least we know if they have the right blood type. So we can eliminate a large group of people. Uh, and a lot of times you'll see me give you baby problems where I'll say, you know, who could have a child that has this blood type? And so you'll have to figure out if the parents could possibly produce a child that has that blood type or vice versa. 
Now, lastly, we have this idea of polygenic inheritance. This applies to a lot of human traits, which is why we haven't talked about many of them. And this is where there's many different genes that all affect one phenotypic trait. So if we want to look at human skin tone or human height, you'll see it's not like we just have tall people and short people. We have tall people, short people, and everywhere in between. And so if you look at the actual phenotypes, you'll see that there's a gradient, kind of a bell curve, where there's some people over here where, where they're very tall, they're like giant. You've got some people over here where they're very short, you know, and then you've got most people that fall in the middle here, which will be average height. So in humans, if you're female, this will be, you know, probably five to five six. Uh, if you're male, it's probably more like five eight to maybe like six two. But the vast majority will fall somewhere in there. But we're not all like six two or five eight or five four. We're everywhere in between. So if you see this kind of gradient where you can't pin stuff down and say it's always going to be, you know, blue or brown, then it's typically going to be some type of a polygenic trait. And then this is just a throwback more than anything. I just want you to realize that when you look at phenotypes, you'll also see in nature, even if it is Mendelian, that there will typically be some fluctuation. Where if we say a pea plant is tall, it's not like every pea plant is the same height down to the millimeter. Because there's lots of stuff that affects exactly what phenotype you get. So even if we're the exact same genetically, if our diet and exercise differ, we could end up being different heights because if you're malnourished, your body's going to grow less. You know, same thing for plants, other animals, things like sunlight, water, temperature, all of these can affect exactly how you end up being phenotypically versus other individuals who are the same genetically. So there is this aspect of the environment or what they sometimes call nurture versus nature's genetics that will have some impact on this.